Okay, so let's get started. Everything good, Joe? Joe? <laughs> All good? <laughs> okay, so let's learn about the Revolutionary War. Thank you all for joining me today. I, I know uh, y'all are probably zoomed out like everybody is, but thanks for joining and showing interest in learning about South Carolina's Revolutionary War. Now, of course, South Carolina had, had over 200 battles and skirmishes, so we, we would be here all day, maybe until tomorrow, trying to discuss all those. So we are going to just discuss some of the major battles here in South Carolina. But first, let me share the screen. Okay, there we go. So this is a quote by Thomas Jefferson. Uh, the turn of the tide of success based on the Battle of Kings Mountain here in South Carolina. And Thomas Jefferson really wrote this. And mo this represents most historians' views that set the American Revolution really could not have been won without South Carolina. Okay, bear with me here. Now it's not, and what was not scroll. There we go. Uh, so some causes of the American Revolution. There were many, many causes. These are just some of the uh, main ones. Of course, the French and Indian War, and then Britain felt like the American colonies needed to pay for their protection that was given during the French Indian War to keep out the French and the Indians from the American colonies. So the British imposed all these taxes, starting with the Stamp Act of 1765, which was the very first direct tax. They had a couple of other taxes, but they really did not affect everybody as much as the Stamp Act. The Stamp Act had a large impact because everything had to have a stamp. Every single paper document, including playing cards and let me see if I can. Hold up a deck of cards here, if y'all can see this. Let's see. Um, sort of. With the stamp on it that was required of everything. So let's see if I can share my screen again. I can manage this, maybe. I'm not as savvy on Zoom as Joe is, so just definitely bear with me here on this one. Uh, so then following the Stamp Act, which ended up being repealed because the Americans just refused to buy British goods because they had to pay the extra tax to get the stamp on it. So then there was the Tea Act of 1773, and I'm sure y'all have heard of the Boston Tea Party and know about the Bostonians dressing up like Native Americans and 
throwing tea from ships into Boston Harbor. Well, in South Carolina, there was also a tea party. It went a little differently, though. In Charleston, what happened is when the chest of teas arrived on the ships, the merchants of these ships had to actually throw the tea overboard because Charlestonians refused the tea. So then we, but of course the British thought that they figured out that Charleston was a primary uh, stronghold here in South Carolina. So in 1776, with the Battle of Sullivan's Island, the British made their first attempt to capture this vital port in the South. So the colonists, including many slaves, would build a fortification out of palmetto logs and sand. And they did this not knowing what a great asset it would be, but because it was the only thing on Sullivan's Island at that point. Well, the British had a thought out plan. They they really strategized. They had the most powerful navy at the time. They said, this is no problem. Well, the ground troops couldn't cross because the land and the water was too deep. Ships ran aground. So then they had these other ships that were forced to sail in front of the fort. Now, at the time, the fort was only half completed. That's why the British were coming at it from all these sides, because they figured they could aim for the side that was not a complete fort. Well, they did not realize how spongy palmetto logs were. Think like a stalk of celery, how you have, it's really kind of spongy and you have all the little hairs of the celery. Well, that's kind of like palmetto logs. They can absorb something. So a lot of the cannonballs shot by the British were either just bounced off the fort or sunk into the fort. The ones that Bell saw were actually captured were by the Americans and fired back at the British from the American cannons. So first use here of really green warfare. And because of this decisive American victory, the British were, stayed out of South Carolina for about four years. And then it became big showdown. So we, the, the British are still trying to capture the port of Charleston because things weren't going their way up north. So they came back down south and in 1780, so we are talking four years here, the British, what they did was really laid siege on Charleston for several months. And they would surround the city, and it was kind of like a snake with its prey. Is it would come in and get, they would ease in every so often. 
Eh. And so uh, Charleston was finally forced to surrender. But I found this fun fact. Y'all might find this interesting. When the British seized Charleston, the, the Patriot weapons were stored in a, one building. And so one of the loaded weapons went off, which sparked a massive explosion. More than 5,000 muskets fired all at once and 180 barrels of gunpowder powder exploded. Six houses were destroyed and nearly 200 people were killed. So that's just one aspect of the siege of Charleston. You usually just hear about the battle, the siege itself, not necessarily those little fun fact kind of things. So at this point, the British are in control of South Carolina. And they, they felt they needed the total control of South Carolina in order to win the war. Well, that would come back to halt them. So leading off here, we have Waxhaw's Massacre. And it, it is debated on whether or not it actually was a massacre, what exactly happened at the Waxhaws. But it was between, it was, the British were led by Talton, Banastri Talton, who was a very ruthless soldier at the time. And so he sent a letter of surrender to Abraham Buford, the leader of the Americans. And this was on May 29, 1780. This is one of my favorite quotes. If you are rash enough to reject them, the blood be upon your heads. And as Unfortunately, Buford did not take this seriously, and a massacre occurred. Some say that Tolfin's horse was shot out from under him, and so his men thought their leader was dead. So they went on, but nobody really knows. Um, Tolfin, of course, being taught and he bragged about it. And he 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 didn't deny it at all. He just said he he couldn't restrain his men. And so after Waxhaws, the phrase Talton's quarter, which was refusing surrender and appeal for mercy became an important tool used during the American Revolution. And it all stemmed from Waxhaws here in South Carolina. After this, the British ordered a proclamation to all South Carolinians saying, if you do not join us, then You'll be seen as an enemy of the British and will attack your farms and plantations. That is the way they justified all that destruction, which led to the Battle of Camden, which if you studied anything about it, it wasn't a glorified battle at all for the Americans. The Americans were sick and the British were very well rested, not to mention the British did outnumber, <laughs> but, and were a little more trained. 
but mainly it was the Americans were ill at the time. They had eaten some molasses and it did not agree with them. So Horatio Gates, the, Brit the American leader, saw that the British were going to just utterly defeat the Americans. He got on his horse and just hightailed it out of there. And he galloped and did not stop until he reached Hillsboro, North Carolina. And it took, so it took him it, three days to get there. His men that followed, it took them a month to get there. So that tells you how fast he was urging his horse to gallop. Uh, we talked about burning of farms, and Thomas Sumter was one of the most famous plantations that was burned by the British, and in turn, that is why Sumter led, started leading the Americans against the British, and also to other partisans coming in. Well, Francis Marion, of course, the Swamp Hogs, you probably all heard of him in South Carolina. This image is one of the most famous of the, it's called the Sweet Potato Dinner. Uh, Marion offering a British officer sweet potatoes. And here, at the relic room, we have a most interesting artifact from this dinner. No, it's not the sweet potatoes. Um, give me one second to put on a glove here. I cannot work the computer with the glove. So, if any, everybody can see the hunk of tree here, or as our inventory says, piece of tree. Personally, this is bigger than a piece. Um, but it is the actual piece of tree from that sweet potato dinner between France Marion and the British soldier. Let's see, I can get back to my shared screen. I'm sure y'all would much rather see the PowerPoint than me. <clears throat> so one, one thing Prince Marion got his name, the Swamp Fox, it is believed to have been given to him by Benashri Talton. And uh, Talton is known as saying, come boys, at, as for this old fox, the devil himself could not catch him. Hence the name Swamp Fox, because Talton, of course, tried to chase after Marion into the swamps and could not catch up with him, mainly because his horses kept fall his the horse's legs would fall into the swamps and Marion often had the marsh tacky horse which is now the national heritage horse of South Carolina fun fact um but the marsh tacky horses their legs were strong enough not to be buried in the swamps. So as I was saying, I am gonna kind of focus on some key battles here. Among them, the Battle of Kings Mountain. Now, this was truly a civil war at Kings Mountain. It was fought between the 
Patriots and the Loyalists, the only um, foreign soldier at this battle was Major Ferguson, who led the British. And at this time, European tactics were to get on the highest ground. So as you see in this map, the red circle is where Ferguson's forces or the British forces would get. The Patriots being mostly over mountain men who were used to hunting. And so they were used to hiding behind trees because of this. Now, their weapons were also a key element of this battle. The British mostly had the brown bass musket that could attach with the bayonet. So what, but the over mountain men, like I said, they were used to hunting. So they mainly had the long rifle. This is the only battle in the war where the primary weapon of the Patriots were, was the American long rifle. And at, at the time, both sides, typically both armies, used the brown bass musket. But it, because it could fire quickly, three to four times a minute, making it a rapid fire weapon for 1700, the long rifle on the other hand would take much longer to load between shots, but it was more accurate, which uh, would prove very uh, profitable at the Battle of King's Mountain. So these are just some images I've got from King's Mountain. And if you've never been to King's Mountain, definitely go. But don't do like I did the first time and go in the heat of the summer because it is an uphill climb. And also, Pay attention to the weather forecast because I have been there before and on top of the mountain when it started pouring down rain. Just some tips. So you'll you'll notice on the this grave marker is of Major Ferguson. He is buried at Kings Mountain during the battle. Why he decided to do this, I, I do not know. But he wore a checkered shirt so his men could find him. He also blew a whistle, a silver whistle. So he made a very easy target for the Americans, and he was shot seven times before he died. And like I said, you can go visit his grave up there. And let's talk about my absolutely favorite place here in the American Revolution for South Carolina, Cowpens. Again, if y'all haven't been, highly recommend it. It, this was an area that the Americans and the Patriots were familiar with, they actually met here at the Calpins before going on to Kings Mountain, the other mountain men did. And so this is truly pasture ground because this was where Hence the name Calpins was they the men would come and sell their cows here for market.
Now, this is somewhat of a different fit, open field than King's Mountain. It looks like it's all flat, but there are slight hills at Cowpen. And I, I can definitely test that. I have laid on the uh, ground trying to see the hills. Um, so remember at Camden, one of the things I said that the Americans were not well rested. Here at Calpins, they were very well rested. They had taken their time to get to Calpin. But General Morgan, who led the forces, knew also that Dalton was hot in pursuit. So that's why they stood their ground at Calpin. And Morgan, the strategy behind this in his three lines, the blue lines on your screen, he knew like the militia could fight, uh, fire one shot, one or two shots, and then typically they'd retreat. So that's exactly what he told them to do. Fire a shot, then come back and reform again and fire again. Oh, Talton at the time thought the Americans were, to were just absolutely defeated by his men. Of course, Talton, a lot of Talton's men were on horses. Little intimidating there. And it, this, this battle with its strategy, if we really got into Calpins, um, it would take a lot longer than this class. I do have another presentation that focuses just on Calpins that we'll probably do at some later time. So just keep an eye out for that. But the, the Calpin strategy is still studied today at like West Point and other military academies. This is one of those decisive battles. Well, Talton lost so bad at Calpins that even he, he would not discuss it in his memoirs. And in the first uh, publication of his memoirs, so he had to go back. They told him to go back and write them. Here are some images on the left from Calpens, and then on the right, um, that is a very old picture of me standing next to one of the cannons in the visitor center, the grasshopper cannons that they have. The British were actually the only side in this battle that had cannons and they had two. So, but they were little, they were called grasshopper cannons because of how they could easily move and how small they were. So let's kind of wrap this up as much as we can. The Battle of Guilford Courthouse in North Carolina was a uh, one of these victories, but that both sides claimed victory. Nobody, the British said, no, we won because we got the field. 
the Americans said they won because the casualties. It, it's just one of those debated things. They do have a good visitor center at the Guilford Courthouse National Park Service. I will tell you, though, that if you go there, typically most people go to walk the battleground and not necessarily to visit the visitor center. But it's a nice little area to walk around. So we, we of course, all know the ending of the American Revolution, the Battle of Yorktown in 1781. This was the last major battle of the revolution. But the British weren't going to give up that easily. The British refused to surrender there. So, in sub, but in September of 82, the British did start evacuating Charleston, but it, it was not until 1783 that there was a formal ending of the war. So let's think about that. That was a two-year time period. And when the British left in 82, along with them went 3,800 loyalists here in South Carolina because they just were, they were so loyal to the king that they felt like they could not continue living here. So when all was said and done with the American Revolution, South Carolina was a state of devastation. Their homes had been burned, towns destroyed, and it was just chaos here in South Carolina. Now, one one final thing, y'all will kind of think I'm jumping here, but bear with me, that when you hear about the American Revolution, typically you hear about the men that fought it. Well, here in South Carolina, we had a lot of women who primarily acted as spies and messengers. And that was very vital to South Carolina's victory. So obviously there aren't exact images of these um, people. The one on the top right is Rebecca Mott handing Francis Marion some burning arrows because the British had taken over her house, named it Fort Mott. So she was giving Marion permission to set her house on fire, even providing the arrows. So she was a very loyal patriot. Uh, our bottom image is one one image that we can get of Emily Geer, who was a teenager at the time, very brave. She delivered a message from General Green to General Sumter, and this was vital because it was through the British territory. And, and long story short, I ha have done, um, I can talk about Emily Giger for quite some time, but she was captured by the British, not once, but twice. And if you go to the Casey Historical Museum, 
just crossed river here from the relic room, you can actually see the Emily Giger room because that that uh, building used to be Fort Gamby, and that is one of the places she was captured. And what since she had this message, she didn't want it to fall in the British hand. She memorized the message and then ate the message to uh, prevent it from getting in the British hands. And as a result, one of the best Battles, the Battle of Utah Springs was a result because some her and Green were able to communicate and the Battle of Utah Springs was actually the, one of the bloodiest. So this is a story that I absolutely love of Dorothy Richardson. She had, acting as a spy, she had heard that Frances Marion was close at hand. So she, and that Talton was not far behind and looking for Marion. So she sent her son to warn Marion so he could get out of the vicinity. She was a very loyal patron. Well, Talton came by. Remember I said he was ruthless. Well, this was definitely uh, right up his alley for being ruthless. He, uh, he forced Dorothy to fix him dinner and then insisted on digging up her husband who had died to make sure he was dead, I guess, and then ended up burning her house while they all stood there and watched. Now, what the, we've heard about Patriot spies here. There was at least one that I can find. Eleanor Lester owned a tavern that would only serve those loyal to the British. And after the British were defeated, she was one of those that left the colony because of how she felt with the British. And like I said, over 200 battles and skirmishes here in South Carolina. We certainly couldn't talk about them at all, but I strongly encourage you to do some research and read about this. Um, it is one of those favorite subjects of mine and of course, the 250th is going to be coming up in a few years.